Oh, hello everyone. Um, my name is Vivica Tom. Um, I'm uh, I'm from Statistics Sweden. I'm one of the IEG co-chairs, and uh, I will start off this two-minute meeting. Um, I would uh, like to. We expect around 150 people to uh, to join. So I I uh, would like to uh, to ask you all to have your mics on mute at all times to reduce background noise. And uh, we will have the only planned speakers to speak. And the attendees can enter their comments and questions in the chat window. And we will address that as much as we can. Although I would have to say, I think it's a fairly crammed two hours that we have in front of us. Uh, additionally, uh, we would like to welcome a new IEG member, the Republic of Korea, who is chairing the, the membership with Japan, and they will take the, the place from now until next May 2021. So Japan will still be an ex-official member as a chair of the Statistical Commission, but very welcome to our new member. And then I'm hoping to get some help with, with a PowerPoint so that I can tell you uh, about the summary of the UN Statistical Commission uh, decisions from Mars this year. Thank you very much. Um, so we have uh, decided that we will tell you of the decisions because it was a fairly extensive meeting and a long discussion. So uh, they appreciated the progress that we have made on methodological development and the upgrading of many tier three indicators. Um, last year, the last statistical commission had a special request that we would look into and try to get rid of the tier three indicators as much as we could. And we managed to do that fairly well in the comprehensive review. Um, so they also expressed their appreciation for the open and transparent process that was used to conduct the comprehensive review of 2020 and agreed to and adopted the proposed major changes and minor refinements that were put forward in the 2020 comprehensive review. And also asked us to continue to do this. So we will continue to do the annual refinement and research and methodological work to improve the indicator framework because we learn all the time as we go along. Next slide, please. Um, so they also um, reiterated that the application of the global in indicator framework is voluntary and country-led process, and that alternative of complementary indicators for national or sub-national level can be developed at the national level. They expressed the support for the establishment of a UN working group to further develop and refine the measurement of development support in line with the sustainable development agenda. We will talk more about that later. They welcomed the background document on interlinkages and the release of the data structure definition for sustainable development goals. That helps us send, to send data more automatically and to exchange and improve data validation and dissemination. Also, that will be covered a bit more later on. Um, okay, next slide, please. Um, so they also welcome the identification of data disaggregation as one of the main areas of work for 2020. So that is what we are dealing with very much right now. Uh, we agree that the group should develop guidelines and build capacity on disaggregated data to measure progress for those who are vulnerable or in vulnerable situations. And encourage further work on a better integration of geospatial and statistical information to better monitor the agenda. And also that will be covered later on today through the working group of geospatial information. It was also highlighted the need for methodological guidelines to strengthen national statistical systems in general in order to be able to produce the required indicators as the system is still very large and, and uh, makes us all have to, to find new ways of doing things. Next slide, please. 
So the work program that has been set up for this year says that we will focus on the implementation of the indicator framework, including the disaggregation of data and the reporting of vulnerable groups and the integration of geospatial information and statistics, but also that we will share experiences and best practices relating to the monitoring of the SDGs, including using national platforms, dashboards, and national capacity building. We each shall also regularly review the methodological development and issues related to the indicators and their metadata. I should also say that it's quite an extensive cooperation and uh, the networks need to be sort of re-established all the time because we get new people in the government and new people in various places. Next one, please. So we will also continue the work stream on relating to data disaggregation, both with the guide guidelines and also to work together with other working groups that already look uh, at specific groups that might that need to be highlighted in the system. We will continue the work with the working group on statistical data and metadata exchange and the working group of geospatial information. And we will hold quarterly virtual open meetings in June and September and possibly in November if the physical meeting then is cancelled, and that's what it looks like right now. And then we will continue to interact electronically and through teleconferences among members of the group. So with that, I pass on the presentation to, to Jongi from UNSD, please. Yeah. Thank you, Rebecca. Uh, so we'll... Uh, uh, talk about the work, uh, the IAG work stream on data disaggregation. So uh, one of the tasks of the, the work of the group is on um, data disaggregation. Um, so the group agreed uh, to do a stock taking exercise, uh, look at the existing methodologies and guidelines and best practice for data disaggregation. So the, the IAG designed the questionnaire uh, on, on this stock taking exercise. This questionnaire was sent to over 25 UN uh, st statistical commission city groups and interagency and expert groups and uh, agency and stakeholders. Uh, so the response, the deadlines for this questionnaire are, is uh, uh, 5th of June of this week, and uh, we already received the from the majority of the uh, people we sent the questionnaire. And uh, uh, the IG uh, and the USD will compile the uh, uh, results we receive from the questionnaires and uh, we'll develop uh, a website uh, to uh, put all this uh, um, uh, existing methodologies on, on the IG website. Uh, another area on data disaggregation that the, the IG is uh, taking on is on small area estimation. Uh, and the group developed a draft outline on small area estimation. This is, uh, has been shared with the IEG member for comments. Uh, and after that, the member agreed on the outlines. And moving forward, uh, a technical group will be uh, formed. This technical group will compose experts from countries, regional and international agencies, and uh, academia. And this work will build on existing methodology works and, uh, uh, and focus on um, case studies from countries. And uh, uh, we also will start to build a capacity building in small area estimation. Another area on data disaggregation uh, is the geospatial uh, uh, disaggregation. I'll leave that to work, the working group on geospatial information to talk about. Next slide, please. And another work uh, uh, I want to mention is uh, the IG work group on measure of development support. This group uh, was uh, uh, endorsed by the State Commission in March. The working group was formally established uh, on 27 May and at its first meeting. So the main objective of this group, including further develop and refine the measurement of development support in line with the 2030 agenda on the target 17.3. 
uh, consider different components of a development support. Provide some guidance for case studies and pilots to be conducted and assessed assessed in an effort to test the, the validity and the feasibility of the proposed methodology. Develop a final proposal for consideration by the U.S. District Commission at its 53rd session in 2022, and develop recommendations for the implementation of the measurements in line with the needs of, for global, regional, and national monitoring. Next slide, please. And the process is a country-led and country-owned process. Uh, uh, the member of this group can post 21 country with the balanced regional representations. Each country has two representatives, one from National Statistical Office and one from the agency dealing with the development assistant measurements. And the chair, uh, there are two co-chairs, one is Norway, one is Colombia. Uh, there are 10 countries can be served as, as observers. The requests need to be directed to the secretary and then forward to the co-chair for decision, taking into account a balanced regional representations. Uh, the secretary of this working group is UNDESA, and uh, UNDESA, uh, along with UNCTAD and OECD, will provide a, a substantial support. Other international agency and entity will be consulted on an ad hoc basis and on a special technical aspect, as agreed and requested by the working group. Thank you very much. Back to you, David. Thank you very much, uh, Yonggi. And that was very nice and concise. And then uh, I would like to pass the word on to Mr. Kevin McCormack, who is the co-chair of the Working Group for Geospatial Issues. Take this on. Hello, everybody. It's Kevin here. Um, so today what I wanted to just do is quickly give you an update on the activities of the our working group on geospatial information wggi can i have the next uh, slide please yeah. so we've had two meetings the first meeting uh, in 2020 was in mexico the 9th 11th of march um the working group we had an updated terms of reference uh, provided by the iag and that was from our, our last meeting in addis um, we had a reconstituted membership with the various experts uh, experience and capacity um, so at this meeting, we considered how geospatial information, Earth observations, and other data can reliably and consistently contribute to the production and dissemination of indicators. Um, we considered how the WGGI can improve the working modalities uh, with the IAG SDGs and custodian agencies, develop guidance and share proven practices in the application of geospatial information for visualization, dissemination, which Yongi was talking about, and the, uh, and the monitoring of the SDGs. Um, we also considered how to lead on the integration of statistics and geospatial information and engage with data disaggregation working group, directly with that working group. So the working group planned to develop storytelling documents and guidance on the use of existing frameworks and standards to apply geospatial information for the production of indicators and for data disaggregation according to geographic location. So continuing on the meeting. Uh, so at the meeting, we agreed uh, on a series of tasks with deliverables in the near and medium terms and agreed to update its work plan to incorporate degree tasks for 2020-2021. So we're going to look at uh, to review the short list of SDG indicators. Uh, this was developed in early 2017 and circulated to the IAG, uh, where geospatial information can contribute to the production of the indicator or the disaggregation. Develop and provide guidance to the IAG SDGs regarding the outcomes of this review towards developing a long list of SDG indicators, develop a WGGI SDG's geospatial roadmap. Uh, this will be uh, complementary to the UNECE's SDG roadmap as a strategic information and communications mechanism that builds the bridge between the statistical and geospatial actors working within the global indicator framework. Develop guidance and recommendations for the IAG SDG regarding the use of proven toolkits Include a geo EO for SDGs, that's air observations toolkits, and frameworks including the integrated geospatial information framework, the IGIF, and the global statistical geospatial framework, GSGF, among other relevant frameworks. <coughs> excuse me, to demonstrate how they relate to the development and use of geospatial information for the production of indicators. 
A vision is to see geospatial and location-based information being recognized and accepted as official data for the SDGs and includes key strategic messages and facts. At this meeting, we had 35 participants, 24 in person and 11 remotely. Of these 24 participants, 11 were expert representatives from seven member states. Uh, we have the meeting report for documents here for people we've already shared to the IAG, but here's the link in this particular presentation as well. Uh, we can indicate that the attendance was impacted by COVID-19 travel, travel restrictions. Uh, the next slide, please. So uh, just a quick look at what these uh, frameworks are. So this is the UNGGIM's Integrated Geospatial Information Framework. Um, so it provides a basis and guide for developing, integrating, and strengthening global spatial information management. It's anchored by nine strategic pathways. The framework is a mechanism for articulating and demonstrating national leadership in geospatial information and the capacity to take positive steps. So this is the key framework here, the IGIS. Can I have the next slide, please? If we then look at the GSGF, which is the Global Statistical Geospatial Framework, uh, just, this is a high-level framework which facilitates consistent production and integration approaches for geostatistical information. It is generic and permits application of the framework principles to the local circumstances of individual countries. If we look slightly at the pyramid, we see there's five levels. The first one is the use of fundamental geospatial infrastructure and geocoding. The second one is to have geocoded unit record data in data management environment. The third one is having common geographies for the dissemination of statistics. The fourth one is statistical and geospatial interoperability. And the fifth then is accessibility and usability. So these are the five areas that we're focusing on. Can I have the next slide, please? Okay. So, so, the, so at this, this uh, so we then had another meeting, which was a virtual meeting, which was held on the 5th of May, 2020. So at this meeting, the co-chairs provided a detailed review of the draft work plan for 20. 21 as drafted, at, uh, drafted during this meeting. Uh, during this meeting, the WGGI agreed its work plan uh, and received volunteers for immediate activities, which are review the short list of indicators where geospatial information can contribute to the production of indicators or its disaggregation, develop and provide guidance to the IIG SDG regarding the outcomes of this review towards developing the long list, strengthen communication and coordination with the international statistical and geospatial information communities and the IIG SDGs, and uh, cap capability inventory. That's an interesting one. Uh, during discussions in Mexico and at this meeting, it came very much clear to certainly myself as co-chair that there's a number of agencies and countries at work in this particular space, but there was no inventory. So uh, trying to leverage our best practices and, and the known knowns, as one might say, uh, it's appropriate for us to have an inventory of what's actually available today uh, within this particular geospatial environment, and that's what we're doing on this one. Uh, can I have the next slide, please? So, uh, as you said, we constituted the membership uh, wide and diverse, and here's the, uh, a, a brief list of who's attending the last meetings. We have Denmark, who also represented, represented UNGGIM Europe, uh, Italy also the same, then we had Indonesia, sorry, Indonesia twice. Uh, so we have Ireland, Malaysia, Mexico, Oman, we had Senegal, which is UNGGIM Africa. We had Tanzania. Uh, we have been inviting the, 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 the co-chairs of the IAG uh, to participate, uh, certainly in terms of agendas to have their input on that. Uh, and we're also um, providing this invitation also to the other co-chairs of the different working groups. Uh, so we had also Eurostat there. We had a company called JAXA who were involved in air observations and then a number of the UN uh, like FAO, ACLAT, SCAP, UN Environment, UN Women, UN AIDS, UNFPA, and the UNSD, of course, which is UNGGM included in there. So you can see that we have changed the, the, the membership, reconstituted the membership. Uh, it's, it's broad. Uh, it's certainly linked to the IAG, and we hope um, the IAG then understands that we have reflected on their recommendations and taken that forward. Can I have the next slide, please? So after all that, and we're talking about frameworks, Let's look at a practical example. This example is from Ireland and it focuses on COVID-19. So this is their COVID-19 reporting ecosystem. So on the left-hand side here, what you have is that we have uh, data involved in the health authorities and we're, we're sourcing this information from these health authorities into the CSO uh, through our statistics acts and this is the microdata. 
Now, uh, you would have seen a version of this particular slide for the SDGs, but we have, so we have a structure in place, and what we've done is that we have, we have worked it out, we have built on it. So now what we've been able to do is from health authorities, we've been able to receive the data in the CSO. We are then have research access for pandemic modelers. We're providing information and epidemiological data. And then what we're able to do is then we're able to feed both anonymous statistical data and this epidemiological data into our GeoHive platform. You are aware of our GeoHive platform for SDGs. If you look at the top under the banners here, you'll see that as part of all the data we're using, the UNSCE, GSBPM, so that's the international framework there. When the data is hitting the GeoHive, you're looking at the UNGGIM and uh, IGIF plus our framework there. Of course, very important that the anonymized statistical data and the epidemiological data has a geocode on it. So once it has a geocode coming from the left-hand side into the GeoHive, what we then have is the ability to start to visualize. When we're visualizing, of course, we're using two frameworks. One is the IGIF and the GSBPM. And we can see here, uh, the first one, which is in the yellow, that's our national geo, uh, COVID-19 hub. So we've built this. So information is coming in on the total cases, confirmed cases, unfortunately, mortality, number of individuals in, in, in ICU, uh, bed capacities, and so forth is actually there. At the outbreaks then, we'll have the geography. This is outward facing at a county level. There's 32 of them in Ireland. So uh, county level geographies, and that's provided there. Uh, there is an, a separate um, um, dashboard like this one here, hub, but it's for internal use only, and is at a much um, a lower level. Uh, we have um, 3,409 geographies at a, a sense enumeration division area. So we have the data divided on an inward facing dashboard at that particular level. We have ICU, we have lab testing. We, so we literally have all of the information that you require in terms of measuring the outbreak and how we can respond to it. Uh, going down to the center one, to the more darker one, we have just traffic volumes. So we're picking up information on traffic volumes. Um, so at different junctions within our, our, our motorways or highways, we have sensors and the sensors in the traffic moving past them. So we've been able to visualize this for our Garda Shikana, which is our Irish policing service, because when the lockdown was on and people were asked to stay at home, we're trying to monitor for the guards or for, should say, our policing authority uh, if people are breaching it. Are they traveling on the main roads? And we've been able to visualize this. Uh, and, there, and, uh, and we're doing this for, uh, I said, the police force. On the right-hand side, then, we have our local authorities. These will be our municipal authorities. Uh, and here, you're looking at calls received about COVID-19, how they responded to it, if they had to do follow-up calls, if it was forum meetings with the local, local people about issues in terms of COVID-19 and so forth. Um, so the ones where the green, they are limited access, uh, restricted access. So we have the flexibility within the GeoHive to have outward-facing dashboards and also inward-facing dashboards which, with restricted access. So, uh, so in, in our view, certainly from the WGGI, here is the example of, of how geospatial statistics can work, can be, be, can be very effective, but it's imperative that we have a geocode on the statistical data in order for us to be able to achieve this. Uh, can I have the next one, please? Okay, so uh, going back to the SDGs, uh, SDG 3, we're going to be releasing, uh, I think towards the end of the next week, uh, a report in SDG 3. This is uh, good health and well-being. In, um, so, so we're going to, we're going to support this uh, release, which would be a statistical release, and I've demonstrated statistical releases to you before, uh, with a story map. And this will be on our SDG hub on the OSI's GeoHive. Um, we've also always taken the position that the story maps are complementary communication channels uh, through traditional electronic CISCO releases. Uh, this is something that certainly we're following through on the WGGI. Can I have the next uh, slide, please? So here's an example of the dashboard. Uh, so here, uh, what we're able to do is that we're able to produce a very informative dashboard. Uh, you can see here, it's, it's, it's built in four columns. Uh, we have three by three uh, for data, and you can have three pieces of data in, the heat, in behind each of the panels. So it's quite informative what we can do. And on the right-hand side, then, we have graphs, which you can have. There's two panels for graphs. Each of them can have three. This is how we build it at the moment. So we're then able to provide a, a huge amount of information very quickly. Uh, this is an economic dashboard that we actually built, which we are actually repurposing towards the COVID-19. Uh, and that's why there's some issues here in terms of spending of credit cards, debit cards, and so forth. This is very informative and we see it a tremendously useful uh, approach for communicating information, 
we're also being able to produce a, a geospatial aspect to it if we need. If I bring your attention to the top, you'll see SDG3 goal, good health and well-being. You'll see an introduction, COVID-19 dashboard, which is here. Uh, you'll have childbirth, diseases, premature mortality, healthcare, environment, and health infrastructure. So as I said, this is complementary to our electronic release, but it's actually very informative and can be easily digested uh, by, by interested users. Uh, I think that's my last slide. Uh, so thank you for your time. Thank you, Kevin. Very interesting and, and very good summarized. As you perhaps have seen in the chat link, uh, we will post the power presentations and also a recording from this uh, on the website. So there is a chance also to go back and, and check things that you might be especially interested in. So now uh, it's my honor to introduce the next speaker, uh, Mademoiselle Joëlle Liost from uh, France, who is the chair of the STMX group. Please, Joël. Mademoiselle Joël Liost, I, I cannot, I cannot hear you. Is, is that only me or is, or is there some trouble with the microphone? Sorry, you can hear me now? Yes, now we hear you. Thank you very much. Okay, sorry, that's my uh, microphone. Um, thank you, Viveka. Good morning, everyone. As you said, as Viveka said, I'm Joël Leos from INSEE France, chair of the STMX Working Group. And I will now present uh, the state of work of this working group. Just a quick recap on this working group. Um, this composed of 12 countries, 10 international agencies. It is chaired by France and UNSD acts as a secretariat. We have monthly virtual meetings and an annual physical meeting. Of course, it was established by EIG SDG and we report uh, to it. Next slide, please. So what are the objectives of this working group? First of all, to develop global data structure definitions and metadata structure definition for SDG indicators. In other words, the objective is to establish how the information should be organized so that senders and receivers can seamlessly exchange data and metadata. And the other objectives are to develop, pilot, and establish data exchange mechanisms for SDG indicators. The reporting and dissemination will be at national, regional, and global level. Next slide, please. So what are the main benefits of using SDNX? First of all, data can be made available to the user in a uniform format. Data can be transmitted to the SDG global platform and further shared at national or global level. National and global indicators can be easily matched and compared. Dissemination platforms have been developed or are underway and can be used to easily publish SDG data. Next slide, please. So how to implement SDMX exchange? I think this is the main question now. IT person and statisticians need to work together on the implementation of SDMX. If you as a statistician, you don't understand anything about SDMX, it's normal. You need the help of the IT team. On the other hand, uh, the IT person cannot work alone and need you, for example, for establish the code list because you are the expert of the statistical domain in uh, SDG. The information about implementation is or will be available on the page I quoted on the slide. And this page will be fair regularly. 
for example, we first seen a uh, non tech guide, especially made for uh, non IT people. Capacity building can be provided by the working group members as part of the development project. Next slide, please. So, what next? The update of the SDG DSD is scheduled for June 2020. We will also conduct a um, pilot of metadata exchange in June to December 2020. We will develop an information portal with training and capacity building materials from July 2020. And capacity building is ongoing. Next slide, please. So, thank you for your attention. Abdullah Gozalov and I uh, will be pleased to answer any questions you may have during the meeting or after. I wrote my email address. And uh, don't hesitate to, to use uh, this email. And, uh, thank you for, for the slide and thank you. Thank you so much. That was very informative and uh, we really appreciate the work that you're doing. It will hopefully make the work on, on all the technical aspects of sending this data to various people um, a lot easier in the future. Thank you. Has some new there is new some new uh, development on that. So the civil society organization involvement in SDG monitoring and preparation for the 2025 comprehensive review is what what this is all about. So if you could take the next slide, please. Um, the issue is how do we try and measure civil society engagement in SDG work? Um, we have received questions on how to measure this as the earlier indicator that was suggested was not really possible to use. Uh, we could not find data that was globally harmonized to, to use. And so it has, uh, an initiative has been taken outside of the IEG SDG uh, and they are preparing to investigate new indicators and then we'll come back for the 2025 comprehensive review um, and hopefully then with, with the peer uh, view of what we could do. So some background that concerns the SDG goals number 17 with the target that is encouraged and promote effective public, public, private and civil society partnerships building on experience and resourcing strategies of partnerships. And we had then the suggested indicators, uh, amount of US dollars committed to public, private and then the amount of US dollars committed to civil society partnership. Now, since we couldn't really find any of that data, and since civil society organizations do all sorts of work and quite dif different in various regions, um, we did not know what to do with that. But uh, so I've received several questions from, from civil society, but also uh, uh, some people reaching out and saying that they are creating a task team with participants from three straight stakeholder groups development cooperation providers, donors, and uh, civil society organizations that are affiliated with something called the Partnership for Development Effectiveness, and then partner country governments that have contacted us and informed us that they want to investigate how to find a new indicator that could then fill the same purpose as the one that we took away. So. Uh, and then to work on it the five coming years and to propose it for the next comprehensive review. So as yet, no details are known on the data sources or the possible suggestions, but we still felt it would be good to inform you about this initiative and also because we feel it's quite a tricky area. So if people know of already existing data collections that are similar to this, that would be good uh, for this task team to know about. And you can contact them. Uh, we put the, the World Wide Web um, link here. So 
you have the possibility. Could you, uh, next slide, please. Uh, and we also want to, to remind them that in preparation for, for the comprehensive review in five years time, um, the, the rules that we've had for the indicators is, is that any new or revised indicator should work with an international agency as the custodian agency of the indicator, both for methodology development and for global data collection, because UNSD don't have the capacity for all the indicators, so we need to be more people than that. It needs to involve national statistical systems uh, in methodology development so that we know that we have a clear connection to the countries. Uh, we need to connect to conduct pilot studies that are regionally representative to test the methodology so that we know that we actually get out what we are hoping to get and to establish a roadmap for how this can then become an international standard, have it approved by the, um, have it approved by whom? Um, by, well, in cooperation with everyone else, I suppose, including us then to, to make sure that it fits where it should be and then send the proposal to IEG for consideration in the, in the next um, comprehensive review. Thank you very much. Um, so that was my slides, and now I would like to uh, turn to the next point on the agenda and give the word to uh, Mr. Mark Hedevaret from UNICEF, uh, who will speak about the national MPI. Thanks Thank very you. much, Rebecca. Thank you. Uh, it's great to be here, and good day to everybody around the world. Um, I wish we could be in person, but... Um, it's it's great to be connecting at least through this, uh, this through this good technology. So I am just going to speak for a couple of minutes to open on uh, SDG 1.2.2, um, which, as you all recall, is unique among the SDG indicators in that the um, national statistics offices are the custodians, and uh, UNDP, UNICEF, and the World Bank together are the uh, uh, partner agencies supporting the NSLs in that custodian role. Um, and so that means that we have been working uh, together to be able to support, uh, in particular, the first the, the definition and the metadata, uh, and then to come up with a, a robust uh, mechanism to be able to gather the data from national statistics offices uh, and, uh, and national partners more generally. Um, uh, to validate and, and bring together for uh, publishing in the SDG database and, and so forth. Um, Multidimensional poverty is, is crucial, of course, because it measures poverty directly, the actual deprivations, uh, rather than measuring uh, the monetary poverty, which is, which is really indirect. Money only has an impact, or lack of money only has an impact, um, depending on what is or is not able to be uh, purchased with it. So um, there's a particularly urgent uh, need for uh, this measure now and because of the expected dramatic rise in poverty uh, from the COVID pandemic and, and the uh, ways that we are responding to the pandemic. And um, we need to be able to track uh, where poverty may be rising uh, to take action as swiftly as possible to uh, reduce or hopefully eliminate any such of a rise. So um, it's great to have been working together on this, and in particular, uh, uh, in particular, thanks to the World Bank for somebody else is speaking too. I will just speak louder because I'm that way. Uh, it's great to be working together, and in particular, uh, I want to give thanks to the World Bank for adapting their tools uh, for us to work together to collect the data from countries. Uh, and so saying, I'd like to hand over to uh, Nobuo Yoshida and Kazuza Yoshimura from the World Bank to whistle through a few slides to uh, let you all know the story so far. Thanks very much. Thank you, Mark. Uh, this is Nobuo Yoshida uh, from the World Bank. And as uh, Mark already described, uh, this is an important uh, effort to collect SDG 1.2.2 uh, market uh, poverty measure. And uh, I will pass uh, this presentation to Kazusa very shortly. But what I wanted to say is that this is an important collaboration across three 
agencies with uh, NSOs and SDG uh, focal point in each country. So World Bank uh, staff and uh, UNICEF and UNDP staff jointly collected market dimension measure in each country uh, with metadata, and we pass this data to NSO and SDG focal point in each country for confirmation. And uh, it was a massive exercise because so many countries existed, but uh, we work collaboratively and smoothly as a result we could achieve quite we made that quite with the achievement. So Kazuta can explain to you what mechanism we use and how many countries we uh, collect in multidimensional poverty measure and what will be next steps. Thank you very much. Kazuta? Um, thank you very much, uh, Nobo. Uh, so please, uh, next slide, please. Uh, yes, yeah, so I will quickly describe uh, what was what were the uh, main indicators that we have collected. So basically, we have four indicators. So one is the official multidimensional poverty headcount. So this is the percentage of people who are multidimensional poor. And this has further been disaggregated by sex and age. So uh, age, for age, uh, basically it is uh, under 18 years old, but sometimes uh, it could be either 15 or 16, depending on each country's methodology. And the second point is average number of deprivations, uh, which is often called as intensity. This is the average percentage of dimensions in which poor people are deprived. And then the third one is uh, official multidimensional poverty headcount of the total households uh, instead, of, instead of the population. And then the last one is uh, child-specific multidimensional poverty. It's also, it also captures the percentage of children who are multidimensional poor, but it's actually slightly different from the disaggregated child uh, poverty measurement uh, in the uh, point one. So it actually uses a methodology which is uh, very specific uh, to child's needs and child's specific dimensions. Uh, the next slide, please. So these are the, uh, the process we use to collect the data. So initially, the World Bank uh, poverty economists fill in the basic data uh, on the, all the existing countries, and then that data has been sent to the UNDP and UNICEF for further confirmation. So sometimes uh, they modify the data, they uh, counter-propose the other data, and so on, and then we um, uh, summarize the data, and then that data has been sent to the NSO officers or SDG focal points in each uh, counterpart for the final approval of the data. The next slide, please. So uh, this is the results uh, of this initiative. So we covered uh, 189 countries across the world in total, and we found that um, 76 countries have some sort of multidimensional poverty, poverty measurement in the last 10 years from 2010 to 2019. And then this table shows the uh, regional disaggregation uh, of, the, of the countries. So as you can see, the majority of data actually comes from the Europe and Central Asia. It, be, it is because the EU has its own multidimensional poverty measurement called as ALOPE. And then the, the detailed uh, list of uh, countries can be shown in the next slide. Uh, the next slide, please. So these are the list of countries uh, which, we, uh, which we already confirmed that, and also the counterparts have already confirmed the data. And then, uh, so this is the 47 countries, and then we still have 29 countries which have not yet been confirmed by the counterparts, but uh, we, uh, we confirmed that the data is available. So the next slide, please. So these are the 29 countries uh, which have not yet uh, confirmed the data, but the data is available. The next slide, please. So in terms of the steps forward, so we will continue to follow up those remaining 20 countries to be included in the next update in September. And also we are aware that some of the countries have been working quite hard to release the new data in a couple of months. So uh, hopefully we will include the data as well. And also uh, in this time, uh, we have not actually uh, collected the regional disaggregated numbers. But in the next update, we hope to uh, include the data uh, at also urban and rural levels as well. And this is not something that we, were, we expect to happen in the next update, but eventually the, the goal of this initiative is to move to the system uh, in which country inserts number directly. And uh, next slide, please. And also, um, actually, I think uh, we will saturate this presentation uh, to all of them. So we also have the annex here. Uh, it shows the more detailed availability of data. So actually, uh, we said that, uh, as we said, um, the, we collect the data in the last 10 years, 
but it doesn't mean that all the countries have the, the available data consecutively for 10 years. So the next slide, please. So this uh, slide shows that in actually in exactly which year the data is available for all these countries. So it is just uh, for your reference. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. That was very good. And I know that there are many people who have been waiting for this. So we're very happy that, that you are uh, doing this work. Um, I see in the chat that there was a question about uh, the individual level of, of children and if if the IAG changed this indicator. And I can say we did not, we have not taken any decision to change this indicator. Uh, so there will be no notes of that decision. Uh, but on the other hand, when we are working with this aggregation, then, then of course there will be several sort of extra information that that is good to be able to provide, even if it's not then uh, sort of becomes an official indicator in the in the sense of of, uh, of the big system. Uh, let's see where are we now in our uh, in our show here. Um, we are entering the the Q and A part of it, and I'm supposed to uh, to try and go through. I can tell you we got very 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 many. Uh, questions that was interesting to read and also interesting to know uh, why what what you are all thinking about um, we have we can see that there is a lot more people attaching to this meeting than what we first thought would would happen so welcome also to everyone who has entered uh, mm -hmm. since since I last said welcome um, but I have a number of, of questions and I will try to uh, cover many of them with the help of my colleagues and here. Um, so I'll, I'll read out the question and sometimes I will answer, sometimes somebody else will answer. So we got one question asking about the tier three indicators, if we could clarify this, the situation with them, such as, for example, 17.17.1. And uh, so the thing is that we no longer have any tier three indicators in the global uh, framework due to the comprehensive review. Um, and when it comes to this indicator that you you mentioned here, we spoke about it in the presentation previously and, and said that we are then awaiting if we could find an indicator that could be used in the and, and put into the system in the 2025 comprehensive review. Um, and as, as you can see there, I mean, of course, we will still be working on things because the system is now sort of clear, but that doesn't mean that we always have all the data in all, in all the parts like we would. So it will be a long and ongoing work and, and it's not like we have all the data neatly packed in a database and know exactly what everyone does in the world, but we are, we are working towards that goal. Um, so the second question, um, what are the results regarding SDG 4.2.1 proportion of children aged 24 to 59 months of age who are developmentally on track in health, learning and psychosocial well-being by sex and which agencies are responsible for monitoring this indicator? So I will ask Albina to, uh, to answer this, please, if you can. We hear you, thank you. Yeah, I can I don't hear you well. Okay. Um thank you so much, Viveka. Now coming to to the second part of our of our meeting today. And uh, the second part is about the COVID-19 impact and responses causing the impact of COVID-19 in terms of data collection, SDG, and vulnerable groups. So we'll be able to hear 
SDGs uh, progress report on SDGs and the survey results that uh, that was conducted. May I now welcome um, UNSD Secretariat? Uh, uh, so, sorry, Albina. Yes. Um, I'm sorry. I, um, I'll, I will welcome you to start the second part of the meeting in 10 minutes time, but we still have some more time for the for the question and uh, an answer. And so I, I asked you because according to the notes that I have, um, the, this question about uh, the SG 2.2, 4 uh, would be part of, of the Q&A. 1.2? The, the 4.2.1. On uh, what agency is responsible for monitoring this, and what yeah. do we do with the with the youngest? Okay. Of of course, uh, of course, uh, as far as I know, uh, for this indicator, and uh, not only only that, we normally cover this uh, this uh, this indicator um, through some of the. Uh, which we think, uh, which we think uh, it can be able to be uh, monitored, uh, and uh, hoping that uh, WHO also will be able to uh, to vanish some capacity within the national services that will be able to on on uh, on, on tracking the 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 the, 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 the progress being made and let me end there. And if there is any UNICEF, then they can uh, chip in on what you have just said. Thanks, uh, Viveka, maybe I, and, and Albina, thanks very much for that. Yes, indeed. So um, uh, we were very excited that um, uh, the, the IAG SDGs and, and then Statistical Commission uh, approved um, this uh, uh, culmination of all the work that we've been doing on preparing this indicator. Um, it's designed to be able to be um, to be collected through household surveys and in a relatively short um, but uh, but carefully calibrated set of questions. Uh, so that will be the main way that that it is collected moving forward. Now it's been agreed and the methodology has been agreed. Now it's the next steps. We're going to start rolling it out and using it. So. Um, uh, thanks very much, everybody. Or is that WHO, perhaps, that, that would know how that works? Did I miss something you said? That? Yeah, no, no, I, no, no, no worries. We'll just move on to the next question. I think I, I, I slipped outside of the question, so I'll, uh, I'll, I'll get back to, I'll get back to my Q and A instead. Um, so one of the questions we received was if we could provide a separate list of corrections, deletions, and additions to the global SG indicator list that was accepted at the Statcom. And this is information is already available in the SDG, SDG report to the Statistical Commission, and it's available on the AED SDG website. So um, if, if you cannot find it there, I, I hope that either we or UNSD can, can help you to get to it. But this, this list should be available. Uh, we've also found another uh, we've also received another uh, question, which is from the stat saying that at the Statistical Commission this year, uh, they endorsed something called the degree of urbanization. And this is based on a new definition uh, that then says the world is more urbanized than previous measurements have said. And then uh, the question is then, what are the implications for the SDG database? Um, as regards this new recommendation. And uh, for us, we can say that this is a good question. We have to discuss this with UN Habitat, but it is not clear yet. And uh, 
th this terminology is not part of the metadata as it stands right now. So uh, we cannot really answer to how what what the effect of this will be. Um, another question that we have received is uh, that many communities, including particularly uh, Cameroon, thanks to civil society and if it, initiatives have worked to develop simplified SDG indicators in the framework of the localization of the 2030 agenda, including monitoring review and accountability framework, something called MRAF. So what kind of resources can NSOs receive to support such initiatives for the evaluation of SDGs at the local level? And uh, the answer there, as far as we I have, can, can I gather, is that uh, through the global Cape Town and the Dubai action plans and uh, the other group, the HLGPCCB, is working with the funding mechanism of, of the SDGs. Um, and then, of course, there is also the, the goal number 17, which is about the funding and the call up and partnership and country ownership for this. Let's see, how are we faring? I still got four minutes to go, or maybe one, depending on how you see this. Um, we have one question here. We are now five years into the implementation of the 2030 agenda, and there are still targets and indicators uh, from SDG 11 to 17, which are insufficiently covered by data. And how can this problem be addressed in the future? And these goals are to a large extent uh, about environmental data. Uh, so this type of data is often available globally, but it's often outside of the national statistical offices. So it's important for us to make sure that it becomes part of the statistics in order to be able to do a, a good analysis and realize how to overcome the problems. And there is a lot of ongoing work on that to build the capacity to actually have country data on like environmental statistics. So even though uh, there, there is a lot of work to be done, there is enough data today to be able to follow what happens with the goals and use it for policy making outside of the NSOs. Um, we have also received a question about how to ensure the data is disaggregated um, for disadvantaged population and in particular about young people. And so this is really something that we are focusing on this year, but also in the future, of course, and we have been working on it earlier. We are uh, doing it as part of our work program to look on data disaggregation, but there is also dedicated work on improving this data situation for young people in many countries. And some of us use school surveys as a way to reach young people uh, in an easier way. And there is a lot of ongoing work on how to show the disadvantaged groups in a more clear way. And at least in some countries, this also makes these groups more visible uh, through the SDGs. But I would also like to caution and say that the follow up in itself does not lead to improvements for these groups. Of course, we also need to have more people to be on board in the SDG process and to actually change the society in a good direction. So. We're working on the follow-up um, and we're counting on everyone to try and take the, the right steps to actually make the, the goals uh, be solved in, in some sense. Um, so with that, uh, yes, there is one more, one more minute, one more question. How can the indicators developed by academic institution and research uh, be supplementing the IEG's work on SDG indicators? And I would say that there are many different processes and separate analysis on various topics that can be used in countries as a complement to the global follow-up. So, so we are very happy that we know that there are more people who are out working with this. However, the, the indicator system that we're working with is, is quite filled with work already. So it, it's not possible for us to take up uh, more things in the indicator system itself. However, to work with people who know what to do, that's something different. So with that, uh, I will uh, I will um, close the first part of this meeting and ask 
my <laughs> co-chair, Dr. Albina Shuva, from, who is the Statistic General at Tanzania National <laughs> Bureau of Statistics, to take over and uh, take the rest. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Yvile. My colleagues, uh, uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the second part of our show. I said earlier on, you have heard about the, um, the updates, what really the group we were doing, and now we will, have been, we will be discussing the impact of COVID-19 in our data collection, uh, our SD in the vulnerable groups. So you can see from the timing, we have just only 60 minutes. Uh, without much ado, uh, let me uh, welcome UNSD to take us uh, through the progress uh, that have been made in 2019 uh, to the SDG. And this is the national survey uh, that was conducted within in our offices. Over to you. Thank you very much, Alpina. This is Yong Yi. Uh, I will uh, cover the first part on the SD 2020 progress report on SDG, and uh, then I will pass over to my colleague Luis to talk about the, uh, the survey that I just conducted. Uh, the Secretary General progress report towards the, the SDG uh, is uh, prepared by UNDESA Stat Statistical Division in collaboration with around 40 international agencies. Uh, this report presents an over, overview of progress towards the SDGs to inform the high-level political forum. This is mandated by the General Assembly in its resolution 70-1. Um, this is, report is based on latest available, available data for the global SDG indicators. The key messages from this report uh, are following. Uh, so five years into implementation of the 2030 Agenda, progress has been uneven and acceleration is needed in many areas. Uh, the world is not on track to deliver the SDG by 2030. So at the beginning of the 2020, the Secretary General kick-started the decade of action to deliver the global goals, urging all actors to dramatically increase the pace and the scale of implementation efforts. The COVID pandemic uh, is further derailing the efforts of to implement the SDGs and threatening the achievements already made in many areas. The first and the most vulnerable people, such as women, children, older persons, persons with disabilities, migrants, and refugees, other countries such as LDCCs and countries in federal situation are affected disproportionately by the pandemic. So moving forward, um, it's essential uh, that a truly transformative recovery from COVID-19 is a pursuit, one that reduces risk to future crisis and bring March closer, that inclusive, uh, closer the inclusive and the sustainable development required to meet the goals of the 2030 Agenda under the Paris Agreement on Climate Change, to ensure the world emerge from this crisis stronger uh, the United Nations, our government, and our partners have to stay the course together. Um, next slide, please. So um, I won't go through the go by go. So basically, uh, the report emphasized that uh, uh, that the COVID-19 has pushed tens of millions of people back into extreme poverty and hunger. Uh, devastating the health system, system uh, globally and the threatening already achieved health outcomes. Um, so, for example, that uh, uh, 40 to 60, uh, the, a new uh, poverty estimation probably will come out in the coming days. Uh, the number probably will be bigger than this, uh, the current showing here, uh, will be pushed back into the extreme poverty. This is the first increase in global poverty in decades. And some 30, 370 million school children are missing in the free school, uh, school meals that uh, they rely on. Next slide, please. But 90% of the world student population, 1.6 billion children and youth, were out of school uh, in early April. Um, 
and uh, um, we can also say that uh, domestic violence uh, against women increases in, in in many of the countries. Uh, women also spend more time on on paid uh, care because of the lockdowns. Um, and, and the health facilities are still in many uh, countries lack uh, uh, basic water service and the sanitation services. Next slide, please. And uh, uh, also, uh, in particular, a drop around the 11% uh, in aggregate working hour in the second quarter of 2020, uh, equivalent to 300 to 5 million full-time workers. So half of the global working force are significantly impact the majority of them are informal uh, sectors. In it. And uh, uh, some of the industry uh, got affected, uh, hit it hardest, such as the airline company and tourism tourism sectors. Um, next slide. And although that some uh, uh, like uh, um, uh, positive news such as uh, greenhouse gas uh, emission are projected to drop 6% in 2020 and air quality has improved uh, due to the lockdown, but uh, this improvement is just temporary. Next slide, please. So uh, we all know that this COVID-19 is also leading to an increase in social unrest and violence uh, that would greatly undermine our ability to fight the disease. Um, uh, uh, in terms of the um, uh, partnership, this is uh, put great pressures um, because the FDI uh, expects to shrink 30% to 40% during 2020 to 2022. And global remittance uh, projects to fall by 20% in 2020. So the report can be found uh, in the link below. And I will not elaborate on this uh, further. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and to accompany this report, we also will going to launch this uh, glossy report, the Sustainable Development Goal Report 2020. Uh, this report will be launched on 7 July 2020 at the first day of the high-level political forum. Uh, the report will focus on the SDG progress on selected indicator and the implication of impact of COVID-19 for all 17 goals. I will include infographics and the progress on 17 goals. And the, the report also possibly uh, uh, include a review of the targets with the 2020 deadlines. And another up output is the SDG progress chart 2020 will be launched around the same time. Um, thank you very much I'll pass to my colleague, Luis, to talk about the, the survey. On the COVID. Over to you. Thank you very much, Yang Yi. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I want to present uh, briefly uh, a preview of uh, the main results of a global COVID 19 survey on national statistical offices that uh, aims to um, uh, obtain information about uh, the impact of the crisis on national statistical system. So this survey uh, is being conducted jointly by the uh, World Bank, the DESA the Statistics Division, and also in collaboration with the UN Federal Commissions. And the motivation for it is uh, um, to, to provide uh, information needed as countries uh, struggle to respond to, to the pandemic and uh, its socioeconomic effects uh, and uh, all, all different types of, of, of data are more important than ever. So th this uh, impact on the statistical systems where, where at the same time there is increased demand for timely and disaggregated data and uh, widespread disrupt disruptions to, to uh, administrative statistical process. So next slide, please. So we seek to obtain uh, information that can help the global statistical community, the donor community, development partners, and the general public to, to effectively mobilize technical and financial support to, to the statistical activities that most urgently need it. Uh, next slide, please. This uh, uh, survey, as I was saying, uh, was carried out by UNSD, by the World Bank, in, in collaboration with the regional commissions. It uh, was uh, uh, conducted uh, via web uh, with an online questionnaire that uh, uh, was sent to 218 national statistical offices. And, and uh, so far, we, in, in the first wave, which took place between 5 and 17 May, uh, 122 uh, 
any source from uh, all regions uh, provided their, their responses. And it was conducted in a platform uh, called uh, Survey Solutions uh, from the World Bank. So next slide, please. It uh, was organized in four sections. Uh, the first one on the general impacts uh, of the pandemic on the, on the working uh, uh, conditions of NSOs. Um, a second section on the status of the main statistical operations, namely censuses and surveys. And um, another section on the the response to to those impacts that have already been implemented by by the NSOs and and any support needs that they have, and then open-ended questions uh, for additional information. So ne ne next uh, slide, please. So I will present to you now a very preliminary, high-level uh, uh, view of some of the key findings. Um, for instance, uh, um, the, through the survey, it's clear that uh, about two-thirds of uh, all NSOs uh, have uh, closed, at least partially, uh, their main offices. And uh, this is particularly the case uh, in Latin America, but in, in, in other regions, uh, the level of uh, activity uh, in, in in the main offices has decreased substantially through the due to the restrictions on on mobility and and, and the measures that governments have imposed on on um, uh, social distances di distancing. Uh, next slide, please. So, um, in 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 response to this fact, uh, most uh, statistical offices have uh, uh, implemented uh, telecommuting arrangements. So. Um, that uh, that uh, um, has been all uh, across uh, different regions, and in particular uh, in Latin America and the Caribbean and Central and Southeast Asia, we see that uh, um, mo uh, at least in some in some uh, shape or form, uh, all statistical offices have introduced uh, telecommuting. Next slide, please. So also uh, the, 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 the vast majority of NSOs have uh, uh, fully or partially stopped face-to-face uh, -face data collection. That's uh, particularly impacting uh, um, surveys and, 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 and census exercises. Um, next slide, please. And uh, the, the, uh, this has also um, consequences uh, for the ability of uh, statistical offices to to continue um, complying with their requirements to, for international reporting. So, mm -hmm. in particular, low and lower middle income countries are seeing a lot of um, a lot of uh, uh, challenges in continuing providing data through the international statistical reporting channels. Next slide, please. Um, the, the survey also um, inquired about the, the various types of uh, operational difficulties that uh, NSOs are facing uh, as a consequence of the pandemic. And uh, we see a clear um, uh, ordering of, of the, the, the impact uh, of the pandemic by, by levels of income. And this is uh, not, not surprising at all. So we see that the, the countries facing or reporting most challenges are uh, in the low and lower middle income uh, uh, bracket. Um, mobility is, is a huge uh, challenge, but also funding in the case of, of low and lower middle income. Uh, countries, they are they are very very important challenges at this moment that uh, need to be addressed. And um, one thing that is also in interesting to note is that uh, in uh, middle, uh, in upper middle income countries and, and high income countries, uh, uh, a very important challenge is related to the personnel not being equipped to work from home. So there is a, a basic infrastructure. Uh, uh, challenge uh, that uh, that uh, um, was uh, uh, emerged uh, when people needed to start working from home. 
Uh, next, uh, ne next uh, slide, please. So, some other key findings. I mean, the the question was was uh, relatively long and detailed, and and uh, we will not go over that uh, uh, all the details uh, here. But some other key findings uh, include the fact that uh, phone surveys are the most commonly used approach to analyze or monitor aspects of the pandemic. Uh, about half of these physical offices are setting up or planning to set up national data platforms to to serve government public data needs uh, to respond to the pandemic and the and the recovery policies. And 60% um, uh, of all the uh, uh, that participated in the survey stated the need for external uh, support in addition uh, to what they already have uh, in, uh, to face these challenges. Uh, next slide, please. And to conclude, uh, some of the key steps uh, uh, about this, this exercise and this initiative uh, jointly conducted uh, with the World Bank and the Regional Commissions. So we, we expect this week, uh, by the end of this week, to publish uh, the, uh, a brief highlights report, including uh, the, the types of uh, highlights that I presented uh, here and, and, and a few more. And um, that would be uh, published on the COVID-19 response website and uh, uh, that uh, the, statistic, the statistics division is maintaining. And um, a more extensive report with uh, data tabulations and, and, and more uh, detailed visualizations will be published shortly thereafter. Uh, also, we will try to make these, these uh, results uh, as widely uh, uh, accessible and available as possible. And so we will have a social media campaign on that uh, from uh, the Twitter account, UN Stats, and the World Bank uh, will do the same. And uh, it would be really uh, helpful if uh, uh, national statistical offices, uh, partners, and, and uh, the, the statistical uh, um, community at large could, could also uh, help uh, share the message. Um, the survey is not a one-off. Uh, it will it, there will be various ways to monitor the evolution of the impact of COVID-19 on the statistical offices and the responses to the challenges. So we expect to have uh, a new wave, wave coming out uh, soon. So with this, I I thank you. Uh, I think. Um, if you have any questions uh, uh, I, in, in, through the chat, I'd be happy to respond. Or uh, you can also reach uh, UNSD Secretariat, uh, the team uh, working on this in this email address, covid 19stats at UN.org. Thank you very much. Uh, over. Thank you so much, uh, Luis, for your presentation. And uh, I will request uh, UNSD to share this report with the permanent mission so that the permanent mission could share with the with the member states officially and being this very, very important report to us. Um, thank you so much. Now, may I now introduce uh, another speaker from UN Women. Uh, you have floor. You will be presenting to us the impact of and over to you, Papa Seke. Uh, great. Uh, thank you very much, Albina, and um, uh, uh, greetings to, to everyone. So I'll just quickly give you a sense of how um, uh, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic has uh, affected our activities and uh, work that we've been doing to collect uh, gender, gender relevant data uh, to address it. So um, uh, basically, early in the crisis, UN Women was tasked to, uh, particularly by our senior management, to uh, work with different agencies and with our country offices to collect data. So some of the early work that we've done, and uh, uh, you will see the, the link there on the page. So it's data.unwomen.org. But there you will see already data on the health impact of COVID-19. So this is work that we've done with WHO to disaggregate the data and I'm taking this opportunity to really thank the WHO team for, for, for doing the, uh, the uh, data uh, cleaning and uh, disaggregation for us. Uh, we've uh, 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 started some rapid assessment surveys and I'll talk about this uh, shortly. And so far we've completed 25 to date, uh, different methodologies but uh, similar questionnaires used uh, around the world. 
Uh, we've selected the, about 25 SDG indicators in 10 different policy areas to inform national COVID responses. And with this, uh, we're actually starting to build a common indicator platform for the UN system um, uh, following a call from the Secretary General's office. Uh, we are monitoring how gender is integrated in uh, COVID-19 country and fiscal uh, policy responses, and this is what is being done with UNDP. And we have several articles and blog pieces uh, on the impact of COVID-19 with different parties. Um, so finally, we're also exploring the possibility of doing some rapid assessment surveys, but on gender-based violence in 20 to 30 countries. But this, this, these discussions are still ongoing, funding the availability of resources. My next slide, please. So uh, I will not spend much time on this, but uh, uh, basically, this is just the, the you know the the methodologies that we've used in different regions. So the approach has been different depending on the partnerships and uh, and uh, the uh, basically the resources available. So uh, and uh, I would say uh, so you know again uh, you can have a look and I'd be happy to answer any questions about this uh, uh, if you reach out to to, to me uh, or to my team. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so, so far, basically, these are the surveys that have been com com uh, completed. Uh, we have uh, 25 that, are, that have already been completed, and this is the list of countries. And uh, we have also nine that are ongoing in the field now. Uh, and uh, another uh, about uh, 12 countries are, are, are planned so far. So just, I think, to say one thing to, 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 to note, uh, as part of this is that uh, the surveys have been, I think, mixed in terms of uh, who we partner with. So I would say that in about half of these surveys, um, uh, the, uh, we've partnered directly with the national statistical offices. And maybe in another uh, nine or 10, we are uh, uh, working with uh, national women's uh, machineries either as you know partners or uh, agencies that sit on the technical committee to uh, approve the questionnaires and uh, the methodologies and so on so i, I again I, i'd be happy to give you more information on uh, where, which countries exactly we put uh, and who was the partner in each country and there are some countries where basically the um, uh, UN women directly work with uh, other partners like the UN uh, in uh, UN agencies, uh, UNFPA, UNDP, and so on, and uh, to to conduct these surveys, or even civil society organizations. But again, I'll be happy to share that information. But these are so far the results that we have for the first six countries in Asia Pacific: uh, Bangladesh, Cambodia, Maldives, Pakistan, Philippines, and Thailand. You can see you can access the results and on our website, data.unwomen.org. And for the remaining 19 countries, the results should be published by the end of the week. Uh, next slide, please. And see here you will see the 12 planned surveys and uh, the 16 tentative surveys. And uh, one thing, to, one interesting thing to note is that we are currently in discussion with uh, some Scandinavian countries to conduct these rapid assessment surveys, which I think will give us a different dimension of this crisis but in, in developed countries. Uh, next slide, please. So just briefly, uh, these are some of the results that uh, uh, we, can, uh, we can share with you so far based on the six countries that uh, where the surveys have been conducted, but we are still continuing to do the data analysis and the cleaning. So uh, these results essentially will be enriched further as we as we receive more more, more surveys. So women generally have less access to COVID in, uh, information uh, information on COVID-19. We see quite a lot of uh, uh, loss of uh, uh, jobs, particularly for women. And um, generally, what we are seeing is that women are being more effective when it comes to the reduction of, uh, of uh, working hours, but also particularly, I think, informal workers are quite affected by this. And this is, I think, something that is borne out by data that is also coming from ILO, but also from the US uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics, where I think it's uh, official data actually points to, to clearly, I think, the fact that women are being affected more in, the, in these job, job, job losses. Uh, and uh, uh, just one final point to note is that uh, um, uh, women are being affected more by the, uh, in terms of the declining resources, 
uh, but uh, men are able to access uh, government support and support from charities and NGOs more than more than women. So that I think is something to to bear in mind and something that policies really need to to start addressing. And uh, uh, unpaid care and domestic work I think is a huge burden for women and. Uh, for women in particular as part of this crisis. And we see really, I think, women taking on much more, although men are helping a little bit more, women are really uh, burdened by uh, the, the extra unpaid care work and that is being done as a result of the crisis. Uh, so next slide, please. Yeah, so uh, well, this is my last slide. We will, we have developed, uh, in order to, to, to do this more consistently across countries, so UN Women has produced a, uh, a guidance um, a document on uh, how to conduct uh, and how we've been conducting these rapid assessment surveys. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, we'll be happy to share it with you. It's available on our website. Uh, thank you very much. I'll be now over to you. Hi, everyone. Hi. Hello, we can hear you, yes? We hear you. Yes. Um, thank you so much, Papa Seke, if you are done. Uh, may I now welcome Elizabeth to take us through on the impact of COVID on persons with disability? Hello, thank you very much. Um, and I'm speaking today on behalf of the Stakeholder Group of Persons with Disabilities and also International Disability Alliance, with whom I put this together. Um, we are learning uh, from this pandemic that the hardest hit are the most affected, and these are the most marginalized people, including older persons and persons with disabilities, among others. Uh, the COVID pandemic and policies are affecting persons with disabilities in very grave ways, such as greater risk of contracting COVID-19, increased barriers in accessing healthcare services, disruptions in needed services and lack of access to public information and communication. And persons with disabilities may be at greater risk of contracting COVID-19 for various reasons, not just simply having a disability, but some people have chronic conditions or the COVID is more dangerous or they can have their health conditions exacerbated by this situation. Women with disabilities, tying nicely into Papa's presentation, can be particularly at risk as they're up to 10 times more likely to experience sexual violence than women without disabilities. And this violence can and has been exacerbated during the mandated lockdowns and shelters in place and isolation periods that are taking place. And most shelters and other programs are not accessible to women with disabilities for various reasons. And although this information that I mentioned is available and well known, it's very difficult for us to find data on this, segregated data in particular. And, and to address this gap, the stakeholder group of persons with disabilities, we asked our members to share what they knew and what they could find on official data sources that disaggregate by disability. And in terms of quantitative data, we found some on social protection measures, uh, in terms of COVID-19, but anything disaggregated by disability and COVID, we weren't able to find anything. Um, what we found when we talked to people is that they could get general information and there was disaggregated data by age, gender, location, but not disability. We carried out a qualitative research study to complement this gap and it's a very uh, short study that we've carried out. We hope to do a longer one. And we held interviews with more than 25 people with disabilities in six languages, including an international sign. We also conducted four regional focus group discussions. 
And we had participants from all over the world representing more than 60 countries and all types of disabilities. And our interviews focused on nine themes revolving around COVID-19, and one was on data. So, as I mentioned, there's a real gap in disaggregation of data, and there are ways to gather this, um, such as the Washington Group short set of questions and other ways. So, these many barriers that we're finding also from our qualitative research, which we will be finalizing at the end of the week, so we can share with you next week or the week after, is that there's a lot of uh, difficulty with transportation, lack of accessibility to information from the government. Um, so even if the government is sharing it, people with disabilities aren't able to access it just for various reasons. And then um, deaf and hard of people are having a hard time communicating because of masks was another interesting example. So we'll be putting this together and sharing more. And I, I'd also really like to recommend that you all look at the International Disability Alliance's key recommendations for disability inclusive response to the COVID-19 crisis. It's on their website, and I think this is really good to guide uh, everybody's work. And in closing, we know that our, our world has changed, and for persons with disabilities, um, we're finding there's increased discrimination and inequalities, so we really need to combat this using the SDGs and Global Indicator Framework as guiding tools to truly include the most marginalized groups to build back better, safer, resilient, and more inclusive communities worldwide. Thank you very much. Um, thank you so much, Madam Elizabeth. Um, as, we, as far as we know, um, question and answers uh, chat window is now open, and we will try to address some of the questions received as well as one sent in in with the during the next session. Um, uh, now let me uh, welcome Canada, Ghana, and France. And I will start with Canada just to hear the country experience on the impact of COVID for the for, for the social economy of the particular country. So may I now welcome Canada to do the presentation? Get yes. The uh, good morning, everybody. Um, thank you very much, UNSD, for um, arranging this. Um, as we all know, COVID-19 has, has really um, caused a lot of uh, difficulties with respect to data collections uh, generally. So today I'm just going to outline a little bit about how Statistics Canada is uh, responding to COVID-19. So much uh, as was shown uh, before in the uh, UNSD survey, most of statistics, well, virtually all of Statistics Canada is now teleworking. Um, we have a couple of people on site uh, for some of our mission critical, but uh, otherwise we are all working, working from home. Uh, there's a lot of uh, different things that we're doing. So the first thing um, I'll start with is new, da uh, new data collection. So we've done some crowdsourcing um, on the impacts of COVID-19 on Canadians. So we've done uh, a crowdsourcing collection on mental health, uh, perce perception of safety. We have currently uh, a crowdsourcing collection on trust in others during the pandemic. We also looked at the impacts of COVID-19 on post-secondary students um, and, and the differences in the concerns that Canadians have with respect to COVID-19. Um, so we've done that. At the same time, we've also done a couple of web panel surveys and we will um, periodically do more web panel surveys. Um, so this was on COVID-19 and working from home. Um, the impacts of COVID-19 on job security and personal finances, uh, are COVID-19 and trust in others, and um, mental and physical health during COVID-19. COVID so those are um, two of the more social uh, collections that we've done. We also crowdsourced um, a survey or a collection on business conditions. Uh, we did that in uh, collaboration with the um, uh, uh, business community in Canada, 
Uh, and then we decided to take it to uh, a sample survey. So we are now currently uh, in process of, of collecting a business conditions survey. And that will um, help the government uh, determine how businesses are ready as we start to open up and the impact on um, both large and small businesses uh, within Canada. With respect to the labor force survey, we have uh, what's called the disaster catastrophe module. So it's our rapid response uh, module that can, that can um, add questions on a monthly labor force survey. And so we did that in April for COVID-19. And there were questions related to the impact of COVID-19 on employment. So those are our new collection, data collection activities. Uh, additionally, we've been, you know, we have a mission critical uh, programs. So those include things like our labor force survey, uh, GDP, uh, monthly GDP numbers, uh, uh, consumer price indexes, etc. We have a list of them. And because in many cases we can't reach the businesses because they're either closed um, or uh, it was impossible to do the collections, we've been doing uh, flash estimates. And those flash estimates are estimates that have we've either done web scraping or we've looked for other open data sources to help provide uh, information uh, so that we can support the government. So everything is now CADI collection. The majority of our collection has always been CADI based. We did have some CAPI for the first, uh, when you first were selected into the labor force survey, it would be a face-to-face -face interview. It is now completely CADI collection. And um, we've done web scraping and flash estimates for GDP to make sure they're out even faster than normal. Uh, business uh, building permits, we've done flash estimates on that so that uh, we can provide the government with the information they need to make policy. We're also doing a lot of modeling and analysis. Uh, we have a new COVID-19 publication and as of Friday, it had been uh, started April 15th and as of uh, last Friday, 25 articles had been uh, written about COVID-19 using the new data sources and some benchmarking. We've geolocated COVID-19 data. Uh, we're also working with uh, the Canadian, the Public Health Agency of Canada to uh, geolocate uh, where uh, instances, clusters of COVID-19 are. Uh, we are working with the Public Health Agency to model demand for personal protective equipment as well so that the um, government knows how much uh, inventory they need to get. And we have a, currently a Canadian economic dashboard um, on COVID-19. The thing that we are now trying to look at is an SDG uh, dashboard. We have, um, in addition to the global indicator framework, we also have a Canadian indicator framework for SDGs. And many of our collections in our crowdsourcing link directly to the um, Canadian indicator framework. There's lots of questions about trust, about mental health, about consumption of healthy food. All of those things are um, part of the Canadian indicator framework. And so what we are looking to do is to create an SDG dashboard um, that would be for COVID specific, um, that would allow um, Canadians and government to under better understand where we're going um, and, and the kind of impacts that COVID-19 is having on our potential attainment of the 2030 agenda. One of the things we'd like to do is add some questions on the environment. Um, I think Vivica had noted that in many ways um, we've seen things like greenhouse gas emissions uh, decrease, but at the same time one of the things we've noticed in Canada is that um, the use of disposable items has increased uh, quite a lot. And so we would like to ask some questions to Canadians about that. So we're uh, looking at potentially uh, crowdsourcing something like that. Uh, with respect to what we're doing outside of Statistics Canada, um, we're showing a strong data stewardship role um, for the Government of Canada as we assess new data sources. So things like cell phone, data um, and other, other data, we're helping other departments assess the fitness for use for these. And we're providing statistical expertise to public health and public safety. So if they're going to be modeling things, uh, we'll be helping them, we've been helping them determine are the models statistically uh, robust? Are they the appropriate models to use? What are their assumptions going into it? 
And then finally, uh, we have a new COVID-19 module on the StatCan website. And um, I've got the link there. Uh, it's kind of tiny, but those are the kind of things that, that we're doing at Statistics Canada uh, to respond to COVID-19. And one last thing, I believe it was last week, the Prime Minister noted that um, should the provinces in Canada want, Statistics Canada would be, our interviewers would be ready, uh, stand at the ready to help with contact tracing. So we could um, uh, have our, our, all of our 1,700 interviewers at Statistics Canada um, help with contact tracing if the provinces so, so wish. And, and these people are highly trained um, in doing tracing more generally, so um, this would be um, something else that Statistics Canada would, would stand at the ready to do. Thank you. Diana, please. Thank you, uh, co -chair, and good afternoon to everyone. Uh, the Ghana Statistical Center is understanding the fact that our ability as a country to adequately and effectively respond to COVID-19, uh, we need facts facts that are based on data and facts that are based on statistics. And being the National Statistical Office that produced largely these data, there was the need for us to quickly realign our activities to ensure that we provide the needed uh, support uh, to the government team that has been put together uh, to provide uh, the response uh, for the country. So the first thing we did was realizing that the Ministry of Health provides data purely around the cases on COVID and aggregated in a way that uh, people are not getting adequate information in the areas where these um, cases are coming from. And so we quickly moved in uh, with support from some of our partners, Esri in particular, uh, to develop the dashboard that provided uh, this information more disaggregated uh, so that it is a, a more interactive and users can uh, relate to where the cases are coming from. Beyond that, we realized that with the COVID, uh, the focus has been on the information that we get in from the cases. However, the National Statistical Office has some additional data that can provide more insight. So one of the things we did uh, was to move in and provide this information, for instance, uh, what are the proportions of the population 60 years plus? What are the proportions of the population uh, that live in a single room, especially knowing the average household in the country? Um, what, uh, what are the numbers in terms of uh, uh, households that, that have at least one smoker or somebody with some other conditions that could aggravate uh, 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 the infection in these households. So providing this information has been very instructive and uh, it was very useful that we as a National Statistical Office provide this information to support policy process around COVID. Then the second thing we at the National Statistical Office had to do is to ensure that we are able to provide additional insights from one of our projects that it started way back in 2018, looking at the use of uh, call detail records, that data from the telecom industry, uh, that can provide near real-time information on the, on the mobility of people, uh, this data is anonymized and aggregated, but it can provide a sense of the mobility pattern within the country. Uh, it can also help the government to adequately respond to uh, uh, the COVID spread. And so we spoke with our partners, which is Vodafone Ghana and Flowminder, who is supporting us with the analysis. 
And as we speak now, we have provided two uh, uh, reports uh, to, to, to the government and to the people of Ghana uh, on, on the COVID. So I have, I'm, I've shared a link to the GSS website uh, for all those reports and all the things I'm speaking about um, in the chat. So we, we realized that when the government first responded to COVID, with uh, the mobility restriction. We wanted to understand whether people are obeying this and whether people are responding to it adequately. Uh, so we did the first analysis and that provided some insight from a normal period uh, from, uh, from uh, uh, 17th of February up to the 22nd of March when the first restrictions were imposed in Ghana. And from the 30th of March, when there was lockdown in two major uh, cities in the country, up to the time the lockdown was lifted, we did analysis across these areas and across the entire country. And it, it revealed that, for instance, uh, between 50 and 60 percent of people uh, uh, reduced uh, their, their movement across different parts of the country. Even for areas that were not experiencing the lockdown, people still voluntarily reduce their mobility. And this has actually informed government on uh, the lifting of some of these restrictions. So this was the second thing that we have done and we continue to provide insight through this project. And we are happy that many other countries uh, and institutions are seeking to learn from the experience of Ghana, especially on the mobility restrictions uh, project. The other thing we have done as a national statistical office is to look at the impact of COVID-19 on businesses, on the local economy, and on households. So we have developed three tracks of activity as we speak now. Two of them are already on the field collecting using uh, telephone-assisted interviews uh, to collect data on the local economy, the impact of COVID on the local economy, and then the, the impact on businesses. Uh, I currently, as we speak, training field staff. Uh, we started yesterday through, we're going to be training till, uh, till Sunday. Uh, we're training field staff who are going to move uh, to collect data on households, on the impact on households. So these are three tracks that we are working with, our partners, World Bank, UNICEF, and other partners to collect information on. We are also working around uh, on some other projects uh, leveraging citizen generated data, for instance, uh, to see if we can collect information on gender based violence. And this is a pilot project we started with some uh, uh, in some of the districts in Ghana. And thankfully, uh, this project has just uh, uh, touched the eye of the president. And, and on, on coming Friday, our, our president is speaking on his role as gender advocate for Africa. And he's requested that I make a presentation on how that project can, for instance, support in identifying vulnerable women across the country and providing them support. And so these are some of the things we're doing as a national statistical office. And I also just develop a concept note because we all understand that whilst we're looking at uh, people who are vulnerable, there are some vulnerable groups who are statistically invisible. In almost all our statistics, um, a sub-country that have a very good administrative data system, they are usually missing. And so this is the time for us to, again, look at ways of reaching out to these people and see how they are affected. For instance, if you are using telephone interview, a lot of these vulnerable groups may not even have access to telephone. So how do we reach them? And so this is one other area that we are venturing in. And I'm happy uh, if uh, there are stakeholders who will be willing to, to support us in doing this. We just completed um, uh, 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 the concept note on that, and we want to start somehow to get some, people, uh, some resources internally to start it, but I'll be happy to get others who would want to support us to look at different vulnerable groups, beggars on the street, street children, uh, uh, persons with disabilities, uh, that has already been mentioned. And lucky one of our, our trackers is also including the question, the Washington group question. So we want to identify persons with disability through this track that we have developed. So we are very much interested in hearing from everybody uh, that if you want to work with us, happy 
uh, to, to welcome you. Thank you very much, co-chair. We now welcome uh, French, Madam Claire Latou, you have five minutes. Yes, thank you, Albina, to give me the opportunity to report on France's COVID-19 responses. Greetings for everyone. First slide, please. The last few weeks have shown an increase in the needs of official statistics, especially needs of new analysis and new and reliable output in real time while INSE staff was locked down. To face this challenge, INSE has had to adapt its working practices to ensure continuity of its missions thanks to widespread remote working and the adaptation of certain household surveys from face-to-face -to, -face to telephone interview. INSEE has had to refine its priorities and to make few adjustments, but most of international requirements were met. Nevertheless, the quality of information collected has degraded because the resp response rate for several business surveys has deteriorated dramatically and the availability of administrative records, particularly tax records, is disrupted in part. Furthermore, the question of relevance of certain statistics is raised. What value should be placed on the criteria for unemployment as defined by the ILO, actively seeking employment in a lockdown situation? What value should be placed on price index waiting when entire swaths of conception have decreased or disappeared together? Therefore, a temporary drop in the level of accuracy of statistics is expected and would need more explanation to assess their significance. INSEE has begun to do it and will continue to do it. Next slide, please. Sure. Yes, thank you. Since conventional methods have proven ineffective or not sufficiently responsive, INSEE has found innovative methods and new external partnerships to produce original statistical outputs in response to the crisis. The crisis has accelerated collaboration with private data producers that had been in the pipeline for a long time. For instance, population movement were analyzed thanks to a partnership with a mobile network that operator. The Economic Outlook report planned for the end of March was replaced with a real-time estimate of the fall in GDP and consumption, an exercise that has been repeated every two weeks since end of March. For the first estimate in particular, only short-term surveys conducted before the current lockdown were available. This has meant finding innovative approaches, rapidly collecting information communicated by professional bodies and businesses, and corroborating this information with instantaneous data on electricity consumption and credit card transaction. Few statistical institutes have been able to respond in this way, meaning that the first INSEE estimate, minus 35%, a figure that has since been confirmed, has enjoyed success well beyond our borders. This new partnership will remain crucial issues as the lockdown eases. Note the traditional sources and the new data sources used since the beginning of the health crisis are not in competition, but rather complementary. For instance, we need structural statistics provided by the census to use data of mobile phone operators. Next slide, please. INSEE has also carried out new surveys in regard of specific features of the present situation. For instance, the French statistical system has adapted and organized survey 
on the impact of the health crisis on working conditions, the epidemiological situation in the French population, the household sentiment, health problems caused or made worse by work, working conditions of general practitioners, the situation of child protection establishments and services, and organization of companies. Next slide, please. Thank you. And now, what will happen? I don't know whether or not official statistics will come out of this stronger, but I can already say that INSEE has done its utmost to bring relevant information to the public with high visible statistics on its website and on its blog and social media. INSEE has increased the methodological comments and explanation to, quali to qualify the significance of these statistics produced in exceptional circumstances. These comments will be very useful for international comparison. INSEE has also taken advantage of exceptional circumstances to accelerate cooperation with private data producers that had been in the pipeline for a long time. The statistical method will benefit of this crisis. If statistics were essential during the crisis, they will play an active role in shaping the world tomorrow. And the SDG framework and encompassing framework will even become more relevant to monitor the impact of the COVID crisis in all its dimensions. Thank you very much for your attention. In our offices. So we are moving to another part of our presentation. We are now moving to the questions and answers. And uh, dear participants, uh, we have received many questions from the legislation related to the COVID-19 and uh, data uh, from the panelists will also um, be given just if time will be allowed. We have also received some questions from the chat. UNSD can read aloud if time will allow. Uh, so, um, let me uh, read very loud uh, some of the questions that we are received during the registration. And uh, one of the question uh, was, many of the SDG indicators would be of value if more time data were available, timely data were available, or real-time data be available. What can be done to increase the frequency and decrease the lag times in producing SDG indicators. Of course, uh, um, to respond to this question, uh, one is to say uh, use of non-traditional source of data, such as big data, private sector data, uh, mobile data, could be used to manage tracking the mobility of our population to mention that few. And uh, the second one we received was many indicators that are related to child development are collected with household surveys. However, entering houses to collect data seems to be impossible during this time of COVID-19. How can we make sure that we are not missing on important data that inform SDG 4.2 and the others? Of course, we have heard this from Ghana and we have held this from UNICEF, and UNICEF is still working on that, hoping once they have done, we'll be able to get the feedback from UNICEF. Um, the third question that we, we received here was, how has COVID-19 impacted the key statistical capacity development work, and what kind of solution have been found to these obstacles? Of course, this is true, and uh, in terms of capacity development, it is true, uh, that is very important. Some of us uh, poor countries, we are used to face-to-face -face interview. Now is CATI 
um, that is um, computer assisted telephone surveys. And sometimes we don't have the telephone sample frame in our households. So you find all these uh, challenges need capacity in terms of uh, training, in terms of funding, to mention just a few of them. Uh, the other question that we received was like, how do you suggest to collect COVID-19 data in regard to persons with disability? I don't want to repeat what uh, this nice lady, um, Elizabeth, she presented it to us on the impact of uh, COVID to women. And Elizabeth, she, 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 she promised to, to share some information uh, on people with disability. So I would request uh, participants to visit the website uh, so that we can get the, all this information and uh, do, do justice to people with disability on this year. Uh, the other question that we received was, what new data collection initiatives and partnerships emerge as the most sweet, uh, sustainable for SBG data collection in the current crisis? Is the role of private sector data growing significantly? Of course, the answer is yes. And uh, of course, Claire from, uh, from France, she pointed out very clearly, mobile companies, uh, these are very suitable for us uh, to determine the mobility of our people. Just like we have seen in Ghana, the way they have managed to track the mobility of people. And of course, uh, all of us, we have seen the way people, they have limited their mobility because of the COVID-19. But uh, uh, I encourage, um, the participants uh, to read more and uh, uh, so that we can get really uh, other initiative that will help us uh, to gather all this information that we need. The other question was, uh, what is the impact of COVID-19 on women and uh, uh, SDG data being disaggregated by sex and gender? The answer is yes, always that has been disaggregated by, by gender and sex. And of course, if you heard from UN women, Papa Seke, uh, he has uh, presented it to us, uh, many countries, that is country doing the, uh, this kind of survey. And of course, he has given us uh, more links where we can get the impact of COVID on women. Of course, uh, as usual, of course, as we know, we women, we are always in this disadvantage because uh, home, home, uh, homemakers, uh, once uh, this kind of thing comes, women is number one. So through you and women website and all this other that has been done in a good number of countries uh, could be visited and uh, have the information on that. Uh, another question that we have received is how does COVID-19 impact SDG in cases? I don't want to repeat uh, uh, what uh, Madame Yongi she has presented it to us um, on the progress of the SDG report. So I will request participants to go back and revisit the, the, the report. And of course, as, as I requested um, UNSD to share the report with our permanent mission in New York, so that the permanent mission in New York can officially send it to the member states officially. And to me, is uh, we national service offices, we can get it. But if it comes through uh, permanent mission offices, it is, um, it is of more, more powerful because it's going to be country um, ownership and it will bring together the policymakers uh, at the center of uh, how, how these uh, SDG indicators are going to be affected. Um, of course, the other questions are very clear. Uh, let me uh, read the last question. And the last question was, how should the national poverty measuring service like household income and expenditure surveys operate during the COVID-19 pandemic? And how can we reduce the respondent burden, especially this type of survey where the questionnaire is too large with a number of modules? Of course, uh, uh, World Bank is really trying to do best because the living surveys, uh, World, Be World Bank, uh, is the custodian agency, and currently World Bank is working with a good number of countries, including my countries, to conduct high-frequency national telephone surveys uh, using uh, 
income and expenditure services, and of course, uh, and of course, uh, the national survey for living uh, for, for income and expenditure survey will save us the sample frame, and of course, uh, eventually we will be able to produce uh, these indicators on quarterly basis in terms of the how poverty affected people, how social like health, water has been affected, and so on. So we encourage uh, World Bank to extend this support uh, remotely, just like uh, what they are doing, because we don't know the effect of COVID-19, how long it's going to take. And of course, thinking more, uh, the new paradigm shifts, we don't have to go face to face all the time. Let's uh, use the innovation and technologies that will cut down uh, the, the cost of data collection. So uh, uh, these are the questions that we have received, uh, uh, dear participants. And um, if, I, if you can allow me, because time is not with us, and I'm seeing uh, a number of participants is decreasing from, from 207, now we are 149. Um, coming to uh, to the last agenda item, the last part of our meeting, that is the closing and the proposed topics for the future opening. Uh, members, uh, participants, uh, I would like first to thank the speakers for their presentations and everyone for their for their participation in this first visual open IG meeting. It was so wonderful. Um, we plan to have more open meetings as described by, by Viveka when she was presenting and appreciated the input received on possible next topics for the meetings. So for us, uh, some topics that we will consider based on your feedback include uh, data collection and monitoring, uh, it is cause high and then COVID-19 and, and SDG data collection, uh, vulnerable groups and data, uh, disaggregation also, and issue of data quality. Uh, before I say thank you again, let me um, welcome Yongi or Madam Viveka, if you have anything before official closing uh, of our first visual meeting. Over to you, Madam Yongi, if you have something that you want to say. Thank you very much, Albina. Uh, we don't have much to say at this moment. I just uh, mentioned that all the presentations and the recording of this meeting will be uh, uh, posted on the website, and you can revisit this uh, uh, meetings. Thank you very much. Over to you, Vivica. Yeah. Thank you very much, um, and thank you all for for this uh, fantastic meeting. I'm very pleased that we have managed to almost keep the time. We are that was uh, in a minus that I was looking for, and I'm very pleased that so many people have have joined us. Uh, so we will definitely continue to do this more, and uh, hope to see you then. We already have an extensive list of, of things that you'd like to discuss with us, but um, so we obviously have more things to do together. Uh, so thank you very much uh, for your time and uh, see you in another meeting. And thank you also to the Secretariat who prepared all this, uh, this, this meeting, I should say. Uh, you have been working very, very well for us. So, thank you again. Thank you. Okay. So thank you so much, Viveka, and thanks so much for everyone. Thank you so much. And let me say uh, the meeting is now closed. Thank you. Say hi to everybody. Thank you so much. Bye.